Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pino Monaco, and I am the Associate Director for Program Evaluation at uh, the Smithsonian Center for uh, Learning and Digital Access, Skilled Up. Until last year, actually, our office was called the Center for Education Museum Studies. And the change of the name represents a formal announcement of the shift in our focus and one example of how the Smithsonian Institution is uh, shifting uh, resources to engage into the digital world. The purpose of this series is to foster conversations. Our panelists today are experts in formal and uh, informal learning with an expertise in digital technology. Our invited audiences are uh, director of education from different other uh, federal agencies, from uh, our educators from the Smithsonian affiliations from across the country, and here at home at the Smithsonian, our colleagues in education and digital outreach. The discussion today, this afternoon, will be on uh, the big picture, so trends and uh, intersections. All our panelists are uh, have extensive experience that cannot be explored in a single hour. We have uh, posted a selection of uh, their books, their articles, their videos, and other digital communication in uh, this Google Handouts platform. In our office at Skilda, we are reading the articles and meeting to discuss the articles before each session, and then we generate our own question. Afterward, our staff at Skilda plans to meet a talk about ways to apply these ideas to our work. So we hope today is just the beginning of a larger conversation with you about ideas that can lead to future collaboration. We are very glad that you decided to join us and to be engaged in these conversations. You can talk to us, we invite you to do that during the session by posting your ideas and help us to spread the word about future sessions. And at this point, I would like to introduce Claudine Brown. Claudine Brown is the Assistant uh, Secretary for Education and Access at the Smithsonian Institution. And in this position, Claudine gives a leadership to education strategy for the entire Smithsonian. Claudine, uh, I leave you the word. Thank you, Pino. I'd like to introduce everyone to our panelists today, and the first is Dr. Barbara Schneider. She is the John A. Hanna Chair and Distinguished Professor, College of Education and Department of Sociology at Michigan State University. Dr. Schneider is the Principal Investigator of the College Ambition Program, CAP, a study that tests a model for promoting a STEM college-going culture in two high schools that encourage adolescents to pursue STEM majors in college and occupations in these fields. The next panelist is Dr. Steven Zucker. He is the Dean of Art and History at the Khan Academy. Dr. Zucker has, was the Chair of History and of Art and Design at Pratt Institute, where he strengthened enrollment and led the renewal of curriculum across the institution. Together with Beth Harris, Zucker wrote the Image Library as Learning Environment for um, the College Art Association News and the Slide Library, a posthumous assessment in the service of our digital future, teaching art history with technology case studies. Our next panelist is Dr. Beth Harris, Dean of Art and History, Khan Academy. Um, before joining the Khan Academy, Dr. Harris was the first person to hold the position of Director of Digital Learning at the Museum of Modern Art, where she started MoMA courses online. She also produced educational videos, websites, and apps. And finally, Dr. Nicole Pinkard, Associate Professor, School of Cinema and Interactive Media, DePaul University, and Program Founder of the Digital Youth Network. Dr. Pinkard is the founder of Digital Youth Network and co-creator of Remix World, a social learning platform that connects youth learning opportunities in school, home, and beyond. In collaboration with the Chicago Public Library, Dr. Pinkert helped found U Media, a public learning space that immerses high school students in a context of traditional media, books to make and produce new media 
artifacts like music, games, videos, and virtual worlds. Welcome, everyone. So my first question is being addressed to Barbara. Um, you have looked at principles of scaling up across different fields to see how this research might be applied to educational intervention. For example, you've looked at how engineers design code for multiple platforms or how economists make decisions about cost of scaling up. Can you share with us what you've learned from your research and what it takes to scale up when one is engaged in an educational intervention? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this very distinguished panel. And um, I believe you referenced our two books on scale up um, that I edited with my colleague, uh, Sarah K. McDonald. And I currently am engaged in a major um, study to help low-income and minority students go to college called the College Ambition Program. And we are probably what I would call in our second stage of um, moving to scale. So the very first message that I would like to give to everyone the, our um, volumes start out with describing how other disciplines scale and very quickly you realize that it's one thing to figure out a new kind of wheat that can be produced. It's quite another to think about how to transform students into better learners. So if we are thinking about education and we're trying to understand education, how do we think about scale up? And I think that the Institute for Education Sciences has been very um, smart in the way that they've organized their grant program in describing um, phases of moving to scale, meaning that you start first with a development stage where you have an idea, you test that, and then you move to efficacy where it starts to get and have more um, subjects or more settings and then finally to a full effectiveness um, model and these the kind of stages or phases are what we see of course in clinical drug trials but they're very useful for understanding scaling in education because they underscore the importance of first starting out with an idea and beginning with a pilot. So what I'm going to do for you in the few moments I have here is I'm going to give you just a few takeaways that um, have been important to us and we have moved into scaling our CAP program. The first thing I think is really critical is this notion about what is your idea and grounding that in um, some kind of a theoretical frame. And I don't mean that we have to go to the ivory tower and search out major theoretical ideas, but here there has to be a germ of an idea that makes sense for which you think something's going to make a difference. And the very first thing, if you're thinking about that project, is you play the game of chess because you start to say, well, can this be scaled? And these are very important kinds of questions simply because if it's a very complicated restructuring, you have to think about all of the small steps that are going to be involved in doing something like that. You have to think through what it would take to move something like that. What are the costs that are going to be involved in this? So when typically thinking about that first development idea is you've got to think about all of the conditions that it's going to entail. So then when you start to plan the development of that particular intervention, that you're already thinking down the road of what it's going to look like at the next stage, and you keep in your mind the costs. And by cost, it's not just a question about what you're going to do in terms of technology, but the costs for professional development, the human costs of time, what it's going to take to get people to change their behaviors. The second thing that I think is always important that we stressed a lot in our CAP work is finding a place where you're likely to have success. And I raise this because a developer wants to start someplace where there's going to be something that might 
likely happen that's going to be positive. So in our case, we went to schools that have lower than one what might be expected college going rates, but they're not at 4%. They're not even at 10%. They're closer to the 35%, which is half about what we think in an, a regular high school in terms of the proportion of students that go on to higher education. The next issue is you have to have some kind of a control. But even at the development stage, you want to be always looking at what are the kinds of things that other um, situations or other conditions have put into place that might make our, have they look any different than what it is you're involved in. When we started our CAP program, we immediately had a control school that looked very similar to the school that we were working in. And we kept tabs on what was going on in that school. It also was a chance for us to think about the counterfactuals. What are the kinds of things that we didn't really think about when we were trying to design our program? Then there's always the question after you have a control about your measures. And I'm going to come back to measures later on because I think that there's an issue here about measures that I think needs to be underscored and I think we'll take that up in the last part of this discussion. The next point is you have to be willing to make revisions. No program gets put in place, especially in a phase one development stage, where you're not going to have huge changes. It's just part of what happens. And then, of course, you have to have some kind of a test. I mean, is this going to work or isn't it going to work? And something that says that it worked. So you've got your outcome, and then how are you going to know that your outcome is really working? In our CAP data, go to college, that go to different types of post-secondary education. And then we're constantly doing all kinds of statistical procedures to see what would have happened if, in fact, um, things we weren't in the school. What kind of change might there be? And then there's the question about um, partnerships. All of us are guests in schools, as well we know. And then the question of partnerships is very real. You can't go into a school, regardless of what kind of a change you want to make, and think that you have a run of the place. This is something that you have to do together, because revisions and changes and modifications are things that are likely to happen. Now, some people have talked about trying to get things very quickly to scale and how to move an idea. Well, there are certain ideas that can very quickly be moved to scale. I was working with a principal of a high school where, in fact, they, she was having a terrible discipline problem, the students moving in and out of the school building all day long, and she did something very simple. She closed her exit doors and changed the entrance to the school, which she had seen in another place, and it was very effective. Similarly, um, I was in another school that used a form of digital technology with both the students and the teachers to get a better handle on homework and homework assignments that were completed. But then if we go to something like learning, especially learning in terms of formative assessment that we are currently very involved with the Common Core Standards, this becomes a lot more difficult because the ordinary assessment tests don't really work. And then, then we have to start to be a lot more creative to think about what we're going to use as a way to thinking about sustained change. So let's say you've got a development, you've got an idea. We had a CAP center, we saw it worked. Then we went and we moved to an efficacy trial where we now have many more CAP schools and many more control schools. And then before we will move to an effectiveness trial, which would basically involve probably something like 100 high schools, we will have what will be a third party evaluator. And as a developer, I think that the question about being able to have an objective developer look at your program and understand whether it works or not is really critical. The, we want to be able to separate out the developer from the evaluator because in this way you have a real objective understanding about what your outcome is really about. Um, I think that as we have done our work, 
we've had modifications and we've tried to replicate our CAP Center in different settings. One of the things that I would say is that there will always be modifications, there will always be revisions in terms of your particular intervention. However, it is imperative that the principles by which you're governing what your particular intervention is all about do not substantially change. So therefore, you're always walking a tightrope of seeing have the modifications and revisions in some way altered the understanding of the intervention that you currently want to put in place. Now, the statistical part of being able to measure the impact of a sustainable scale-up intervention are really quite critical. In our manuscripts, we talk about those things and we raise those things and suggest very different kinds of methods that are currently in place, how you are able to measure an effect. I think that for those of us who work, no matter whether we're working in digital technology and what other kinds of mediums we want to um, be engaged in, there is fundamentally a question where we have to say, did it work or not? And we have to use some sort of a real test of significance to be able to make sure that what we actually have is something that's a true effect. Now, have I taken my 10 minutes, or can I move on, or tell me what to do here, please? So, so why don't we hear a little bit from Nicole, um, and we'll come back to you. Um, so we want to know what we can learn from the experiences of people and organizations that have t successfully taken youth programs and educational resources to scale. Um, and so I wonder if Nicole could tell us about um, her journey um, and what happened when you took programs to scale and what you learned from that process. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, Barbara, it's great to be on a, um, a panel with you because I've you know, known about your work forever. Um, so first I want to say that one of the things about scale, and um, let me say a little bit about the work and then contextualize it. So we've been fortunate to be funded to create um, digital media learning environments, hybrid learning environments for urban youth to help develop their digital literacies. Often these programs have taken place in school but have started, have tried to bridge in and out of school and we've used technology, social networks to, to do that bridge. Um, we've also been fortunate to partner with the Chicago Public Library to launch um, a space in place called Umedia which was five years ago, four to five years ago, a new way of thinking about libraries. And when we started that work, and that's what I'll talk about uh, right now, that work was uh, focused mainly on the out-of-school space. Um, and it was trying to take a library in Chicago that is downtown, which is at the intersection, but to see if we could create it as a space that you would want to come to. And one of the interesting things about that project, when I was initially approached, I felt that I was like, you want me to make the library a place that um, all kids, but particularly black, black and brown kids, are going to want to come to after school out of their way. I thought it was going to be difficult to do, but quickly realized that when you have the right partners at the table um, and when organizations are willing to adapt their cultural norm um, to reach a goal, then the libraries actually became one of the best places for me to actually do the work. And so we were fortunate to work with uh, CPL to create the media. But what it did, and we didn't quite completely understand this initially, is that it created a space that no one owned because it wasn't in anyone's neighborhood, because it was down, downtown. It wasn't near anyone's hood, if you will. So it was a place that all kids can come and, and be connected to. And within the first year, there was a lot of success. It was perceived as being highly successful. And I think, Barbara, it goes also to your point of, first we had to define what is success. So it's success. Was it successful because it, it brought together kids all across the city? Was it successful because it was developing kids' digital literacy? Was it successful because it was having an impact back in the school day? To all of those, I would say that we we didn't um, we partnered with uh, the University of Chicago's Urban Education Institute to do the assessment of it. But by the time the decision was made to scale, I wouldn't say that we knew the answers to all of those questions. And the decision to scale the work initially first in Chicago, 
was primarily made because of the um, the large numbers of kids who were finding their way to the place and were saying, we don't have any other places like this in the city and we need more places like this. So I think in that sense, the measure of success was, are we getting kids first into the libraries? Um, and we also knew that the book circulation in, in that particular library was as big, was much larger than any of some of the local branches. So I think from the libraries, the measure of success was that book circulations were increasing and you who normally don't come here attend. And so the dilemma for us in scaling were twofold. One is we had to understand what was contextual to the location, what was um, really about the model, and how much of that could be translated into other places. So for instance, in Chicago, the, the U Media Library is um, 5,000 square foot space that only high school students can enter. As we scaled to other parts of Chicago, they were much smaller and they weren't dedicated spaces to high school students. So one of the questions for us is, well, is it about it being dedicated space that makes kids want to come, or is it about um, you know the fact that is you know they have laptops and all this music equipment? And so we had to be um, had to be reflective and had to have research partners alongside us who can sort of have a um, an unbiased perspective of what was of what was going on in order to help us uh, to understand. And at the same time, there's a, a partnership with IMLS and MacArthur to scale you media. The now is, I think, is in 30 locations. So we then made the decision that what we were trying to scale was the idea and not the model. And so we weren't trying to get everyone to replicate U Media because first we couldn't tell you exactly what you should replicate given we hadn't been around that long. But we could say that the concept of youth, um, new spaces for youth in libraries that allow you to be loud, to connect with each other, to have a lot of hands-on problem uh, project-based learning that is connected to books and also connected to technology that brought in artists from the outside. There were components of how you put them together in your city needed to be um, customized and contextual for your city. And so I think one of the better decisions I think we made was to relax, to, relax the, to, to say it was the idea not the model, which then I think gave a lot more freedom for others to um, innovate and do what they or doing across the country. And then I think it provides a larger uh, test bed for researchers to now come in and say, well, what are all these examples of media learning labs? What's common about them? What's not common about them? And then I think in that case, it, I think it provides it's a more interesting place now to come in and understand what, do, what are the components of these types of spaces that um, need to exist to engage you first, because they have to come in order for you to have learning outcomes. That engages them to keep coming but also, are there certain components across these different spaces that lead uh, that lead to the intended uh, learning outcomes? Now, we've done um, in other examples. I have uh, my other work where it's the model that we replicate, and in that case, we took five years working in one school in one context, really refining the model, working with Bridget Barron, a partner out of uh, Stanford, as a research partner, to really refine the model. Um, and we've taken that model to other places. But in that instance, we want I want to walk into any school and I want to see, you know, the work happening in the way in which it was conceptualized uh, to happen. So the lessons for me is being clear about whether it's the idea or the model you're trying to scale. Understanding as you and also understanding, and this is I think where technology is important, um, oftentimes the decisions you make you, when you build something initially, you often aren't building it to scale, you're building it to understand the situation and the context, particularly from a research standpoint. But so many of the decisions you make early on often come back to haunt you if you want to scale. So you sort of have to think about, I'm going to be successful, and let me make these decisions in the beginning that will allow for scale, because you don't want to be in the middle of, you know, of scaling and all of a sudden say you have, to, you have to go back and start over because technically you didn't build a platform to be used or, you know, by thousands of kids or hundreds of thousands of kids. You only thought it was going to be used by a hundred. Uh, and so I think there's oftentimes a lot of uh, technical decisions that we need to, we need to build for success uh, in the beginning um, so that our success doesn't hinder our ability to do what we're going to do. And that also has implications for the partnerships because oftentimes if you need additional funds to scale, um, the decisions you make around partners early on uh, limit that. And then is um, having the final thing I'll say about this is um, it was very it's very important oftentimes if you're 
in the act of creating and doing, you don't have the moment to be as reflective as you need to. So you have to have the collaborators and partners who have the freedom to be reflective and to sort of step back and see what's taking place and to provide you with the um, um, information, the lessons, the, the data in ways that allow you to, as we say, turn on a dime. So to say, this isn't working, and uh, I can take this information in and I can change it. So you have to structure up your partnerships early on to make sure that you um, that you have the right mix of people so that you have people attending to what it is that they do best. Because oftentimes the person who's the innovator isn't the person who necessarily needs to scale something. It's a different skill set. Um, and so I think you have to think from the beginning about those types of relationships um, and who needs to be at the table so when, as you, when you do you're not in a situation where you're handing off to, uh, to individuals who haven't been connected at all to the uh, to the growth and development uh, process. I'll stop there because um, and I can answer questions about it later. Great, thank you, Nicole. So now we're going to go to um, both Beth and Stephen. Um, you've been successful in bringing art history to a broader and larger audience through smart history. Um, and you've recorded conversations in front of works of art and curated links to images and videos and high quality digital resources. Um, and so now you're at Khan Academy and you have an even larger audience. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey as you took your program to scale and what you learned along the way? Sure, absolutely. Um, I just want to thank you, Claudine, for inviting us and uh, to other members of the panel, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. So um, we were going to start by um, just saying a, a stat that we find amazing, and and, um, and that is that when we were, Stephen and I met when we were both teaching art history at um, uh, State University of New York, and at that time, about 10 years ago, we taught 200 students a semester. These days, through Smart History at Khan Academy, we're reaching about that actually, that was 200 a year. Now we're reaching 7 million a year, um, which is just phenomenal and nothing that we planned for from the beginning. So we were going to start by just talking a little bit about scale for us and for Khan Academy and where we are now, and then move on to what we learned along the way about scaling, and then a couple of things that we, um, we probably would do differently if, if we could. So um, as you mentioned, uh, our project, Smart History, is now part of Khan Academy. Khan Academy itself is visited by about 10 million uh, students, uh, learners, every month. Those are unique visits or unique visitors. Um, and on the art history side, uh, we've had we've, we've introduced quizzes in the last few months, and we've just made our one million um, exercise was was responded to. And so it's a kind of scale that is just out of our reference frame, right. and and we'd like to talk a little bit about how we got. Yeah. So so from you know seven million people a year looking at the art history, ten million a month looking at the Khan Academy content, um, three hundred thousand registered educators at Khan Academy. So really a kind of scale I think that was unimaginable to us in the beginning, and I think often unimaginable generally, especially to um, sort of legacy analog institutions. Part of this has to do with a change of mindset. Instead of looking at a very targeted audience, it is really thinking about a global community. And one of the things we've really discovered is just how hungry uh, so many people are around the world to, um, to find high quality content. Um, and one of the ways that we've begun to do this is to actually translate our content into multiple languages. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're actually translating the entire Khan Academy site now um, into uh, four languages, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Turkish. But there are, um, but there are uh, numerous uh, less formal efforts to translate into dozens of other languages as well. So we really are thinking about different audiences. Almost every country in the world, uh, save three, visited the art history content on Khan Academy last year. And so these are people with widely different um, backgrounds, widely different cultural, cultural differences, um, historical differences, and um, and it really has made us think about that content in, in very different ways. So to, to fill you in a little bit about the content, we're talking about nearly a thousand assets, essays, and videos on 
uh, art history content. And we think that, you know, speaking about audiences, we're, one of the things I think we learned was not, was not to divide our audience. That if we looked at learners age, I don't know, 12 or 13 and above, basically we were looking at people who were curious, interested to learn. We assumed learners who were intelligent, but just uninformed you know, about the um, work about the discipline of art history and about learning about works of art. So, sort of, you know, talking to an intelligent user meant, or, you know, in a kind of intimate, informal, conversational way, meant that we could talk across teachers, middle school, high school, retired people, you know, professionals in graphic design industries who wanted to update themselves in art history. And that meant that we really, you know, we didn't segment the audiences and put resources in different places, but we're really able to make the most of the, the small amount of resources that we had to reach as many people as possible. And as a result, if you Google um, major works of art these days, if you Google, for example, Mona, Mona Lisa or Michelangelo's Sister Ceiling or Michelangelo's David, we often come up, up second or third or maybe fourth and which is just a remarkable thing to us. And um, and so we think that talking across those audiences has, has really helped. Yeah, those kinds of Google search results, I think, are a result of a number of different decisions that we've made um, and some things that we've really just stumbled on. Uh, and it, it has to do, I think, to a large extent with providing content that people need with as few barriers to that content as possible. Um, we've really made an effort, and I think Khan Academy has done an extraordinary job. Um, is a group of brilliant researchers, uh, brilliant developers there that have really done everything they can to keep that bar as low as possible. So you don't have to log in, you don't have to enter a username and password. Um, all the content is there and, and available. It's all free, there's no advertising, etc. Um, and so the idea is to make things as accessible as possible when people need it. And the kind of content as well is very much geared to the kind of things that are most often taught, most often needed. And so we, we are looking at the things that are that are taught most often in uh, introductory survey courses, et cetera, um, in general in civ courses non, in non-Western as well. Um, and so that idea of, of removing those barriers is crucial. And I think that part of this speaks to our high rankings, although we'd like to credit ourselves. I think the high rankings are also due to the fact that there's not a lot of really reliable learning content that's on, on the web, at, at least in our discipline, in the discipline of art history. And so often when students would Google, they would come up with new production sites and things like that. And I think that over the years, there's been a missed opportunity for universities and put their content openly, lots of content openly on the web. And so you know, student, you know, instead of those resources rising to the top, unfortunately, other less reliable resources have risen. So there really is this kind of responsibility um, that I think major institutions have to do this, and 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 I think that's happening. And more and more um, major museums are are putting their content out in open licenses, making things available, and it's it's crucially important. Um, and it and it is providing a world with with uh, with access to their own cultural heritage, which is which is crucially important. Right. Um, the one of the other issues that I think is, is really developing, uh, I think, with more and more momentum now among museums, for instance, is um, having very clear open license language. Um, you know, teachers especially are very hesitant um, to wade into um, any kind of rights issues unless things are really clearly spelled out. So the more plain language, the better. And we, we make a real effort to do this on our, on, on our own side as well. Um, we've, uh, for instance, uploaded over 3,000 photographs of, of major works of art and architecture and put them in an open Creative Commons license on Flickr. And people find them there, but then people also find the learning resources through that. So they're, they're finding our content not simply through um, knowing about it, not simply through their teachers, for example, but also through their own needs. Um, and, and it could be simply the need for an image for a, for a student paper. Right. Um, so we're also scaling, we think about scaling our audiences at Khan Academy, we have very specific goals in terms of engagement and, um, and numbers of people coming and using the site and doing exercises. But we're also trying to scale 
content. We're, we're now partnering with major museums, the Getty Museum, um, the Tate, the um, uh, Asian Art Museum, and the Museum of Modern, Museum Art. Modern Art. And so really trying to help bring the, that, those museums those museums' content. So instead of visiting those different museums and their own website, bringing that content together at a place where people are coming to learn, um, and mostly coming to Khan Academy to learn math and science, but then hopefully finding the art-related content and you know discovering it and taking an interest in it. The, the notion of scale is an interesting one. I think we generally think about scale in terms of this, the scale of audience, the scale of users, the scale of participants. But it also has to do, I think, really at least, with the scale of contributors, of participants, uh, in the sense of the back end. And, um, and we're, we're using something called the Trello Board, actually, currently, to help organize over 100 uh, scholars that are helping to support our, uh, this effort and to create um, openly licensed content uh, that people can use to learn around the world. And in terms of the couple of things that we thought about we would, that we would change, actually something came up that Nicole just mentioned too, which is sort of planning for scale early on. And I, you know, in some ways this is a virtue, but in some ways it was a real pitfall. We, when Steve and I started Smart History, we actually just made it as a site for our students. And so, you know, a few hundred students, a website. Um, and um, as a result, we kind of thought small. And in some ways, that was good, because it meant our process was very iterative. Um, but on the other hand, we ended up locked in with an interface on the website that, while in many ways it's been very good, it, it, it locked us into a structure that we couldn't change easily or um, keep. I want to go back to the idea, the, the reference to Nicole as well. That issue of agility, that issue of, um, of the iterative, I think is incredibly important. I, I worry a little bit about large plans, about sort of um, thinking too far ahead. Um, yes, you want to plan for scale, but I think what's crucial, and I think really part of our success has been that we didn't know the answers. We didn't, um, we didn't know exactly how this was going to unfold and where to look uh, next. Instead, we looked to our users. We asked a lot of questions. We paid a lot of attention to the people who were using the site. And we made changes that were based almost entirely on what we were learning from them. Great. Um, so just a few follow-up questions. If we think about scaling as being able to increase what we do incrementally while sustaining the quality of the original product, what are some of the lessons that you've learned about the issue of quality? Actually, I think it was... Uh, is, is, that for, is, that, is that for us? I was, open I, question. All right, I'll jump in first and then... Um, because actually, I'm really glad we didn't maintain the quality we had in the beginning, because we got a lot better. Um, and so I think you know that one of the things that that's related to that is just doing a lot of work and putting it out there, not spending a lot of time making it perfect before we put it out there, but being willing to put things out that we're, we're as good as we could do at the moment, but not worrying terribly much about perfection, but learning from doing from making a lot of things and, and, and putting them out there and hearing back and just getting better each time we made uh, more content. Anyone else want to respond to that? Um, I, I would like to say that I think that um, one of the things that Nicole said was really important, which is the difference between an idea and a model. And if you're going into a classroom and you're dealing with issues that are related to learning, um, in instruction, you just can't just let it out there. I mean, because the implications could be that you might be doing something that has some unanticipated consequences that could be negative for the young people that are in the classroom. I think that a lot of um, what happens in terms of moving to scale has to be thought about in the context of is it an idea, is it a new model, is it a product? that each of these different um, uh, models that you've actually brought to this conversation um, have very different uh, backgrounds, they have different intended audiences, and the models by which they are moving to scale are quite different. One of the, um, I thought that you had raised a very important um, question when you had this notion about, you know, why pro some programs fail. 
And in education, one of the reasons that programs tend to fail a great deal is because we don't think about the variation and what's going to happen from one side to another. What It worked here, but will it work for everybody in a different kind of setting? Would it work for um, students who've had different kinds of experiences? If you brought in a new teaching technique, what about teachers who were trained in one particular way? Maybe they would be resistant to something else. So I think that there are different kinds of rules and kind of guidelines and principles that um, make this conversation a little bit more difficult when you're trying to place and move away and come up with some generalizations as they would apply both to the idea, both to something like um, uh, the kind of openness to a digital technology like the art history which the implication for you know how long someone is on a site, whether you're going to worry about the issue of impact versus versus sustainability and deepness of change in behavior as a consequence of participating in a particular activity, that these kinds of um, ideas really become very important in trying to understand scale. And I think all of you kind of referenced having a kind of agility and being in a position where you could learn from what you've done before so that you could modify whatever was coming next. Um, so can you scale up and have deep impact at the same time? Anybody? Well, I'm not sure why those would need to be um, oppositional. I don't think they're oppositional. I, I think that what we're looking for are some examples. Mm -hmm. um, so if the projects that you're talking about are iterative, if you're learning from them, if they're changing as you um, proceed, um, where do, how do you get to that depth of learning? How do you get to a point where you know that your audience is at one place and you could take them to the next stage? Um, and are there examples of that that you could share? I can, um, so I think that's a, that's um, I think we all hesitated for a second, but I think it's a very you good see. question. And I think a lot of it has to do even with what the approach is. So if in the case of, um, if like when you're scaling like face to face and you're trying to understand how do you use online tools to help scale, there is always a question around what, you know, what translate, what can be translated online and what, you know, really has to be done face to face. But I think in those conversations when you're trying to use online as a as a as a vehicle for scale, there is I think there is you have to ask yourself what uh, what what do you really value in in your model um, that is going to be impacted in the online transition, and then and I think that's where blended learning has become uh, very powerful in ways in which how what can you outs outsource to the online, but then make sure that you can develop your facilitators and your teachers to keep those important uh, components that need to be done face to face. And I think we're really, really at the beginning stages of understanding how this all works together and what is online and what is face to face. I think it's when, when your model is purely face to face or purely online, then I think that's a, then in that sense I don't think there's one or the other because you hope that as you're, as you're bringing it to more people, you're still having a uh, deep impact. But I do think the blended spaces, when, when online is a vehicle for scale, you do have to consciously and constantly ask your question, have you, in, in, in what you've moved online, have you, in some sense, done a leap of mutation to the, um, to the core components that are necessary for, the, uh, for your model to uh, work effectively. So your response um, concerning blended learning leads to one of the questions that a member of the audience has posed, and that is that so many current successful programs have a human interaction component, and how do you scale a program and sustain those relationships? Um, anyone can answer that question. I think one of the things that, that works best on the Khan Academy platform and uh, and we found, especially for the art history content, 
is the sort of vibrant learning community that that exists. Um, there is a there is a wonderful gamified environment that really invites participation, uh, asking questions, answering questions, voting up questions, voting down questions, um, sort of bringing um, the, the strongest content to the top. And it's it's animated, it is uh, engaging, and um, and and it actually has in an informal way. Um, spoken to the to the previous question, which is, it's, I've watched the arc of learners um, and their level of sophistication change over time in a really quite extraordinary way. But I think that um, the carefully sort of constructed social environments can really help to engage students. And um, I will also say that I think one of the things we've seen in, with the use of blended these blended models is having is complexifying our definition. Maybe complexifying is the wrong word. But um, with uh, the, the um, creating a continuum of type of mentors and support facilitators and teachers that are needed. So you might have what we've done in a program we call Digital Divas that's trying to develop the STEM literacy of girls, and we're trying to work in communities that often don't have a lot of that expertise. Then what we've done is we've made sure that we've developed the individuals who are leading the program who are really responsible for creating a culture where the girls want to come back to. So we partner with MIT and we partner with colleagues in other places, University of Indiana, um, who provide some of the online um, critique and mentoring around this core substance of the content. And so trying to think of ways as opposed to saying one person has to do it all. And we also use online tools to support some of the, you know, some of the learning. So how do you blend together? different types of expertise because you could have people who know a lot about the technical but who can't create an environment where girls want to come to or an environment where people create a great environment but they can't answer the technical. So we no longer have to view them as one as, as one person has to do all of it. I think we can be very creative about how do we make use of tools such as Khan Academy and, and how do you pull pieces together to create like a learning ecosystem. And I think if you think of things as a learning ecosystem where you where you say how do I keep pieces together that I think it makes it easier to create these blended types of uh, blended types of spaces. So I'm going to ask Barbara to take this next question from our audience. What advice can you offer on creating assessments and evaluations that will inform scaling up? What questions should we ask from the very beginning? Well, I think the very most important thing is how you're going to define success of your program or your idea. Um, and that you have to have that as a something that you're going to hang your hat on and say this is what this is really all about and you that has to be tangible and it should be real um, and the other thing that I think is really critically important here are to be able to have some kind of measures in terms of what you're moving towards that success so a measure could be something like how long are they on a site or how many times do they return to that site or is there some sort of social network system that's currently in place where multiple people come back to a particular site. Um, that It just becomes the kind of situation where we have to think a little bit more creatively than we thought about in the past but nonetheless we still have to have some ways by which we're understanding the phenomenon and how people's behaviors and attitudes are changing as a consequence of being engaged. Mm -hmm. I think that without that, um, one of the difficulties comes into, which goes back to the question that you asked previously, is um, this question about deep impact because very oftentimes, you know, we can see in so many things, you know, you can get traffic on a site or you can get 30 to, you know, 75,000 people that might be trafficking around a site but no one's really engaged in that site in any really systematic, sustainable way. So then the question becomes, if we're trying to really make a change in attitude and make a change in behavior, how do we really know that that's happening? And the, it seems to me that one way to start to think about that is to put in place a series of um, different kinds of measures. Some of the measures that people are thinking about today um, are very different than the measures that we, you know, had typically seen in the past. People are accumulating different kinds of recordings on 
their phones and other kinds of ways about ways that they are accumulating information, how they're going back to that information, how they're using that information in very different kinds of ways. But we can't really get to a, you know, a, what I would consider to be a um, realistic evaluation of a something that's being brought to scale without a series of, of measures as they relate to a specific outcome. And can I add one point to that? I think, Barbara, that's so important. And particularly as we begin to use online systems like Khan Academy and other systems that uh, also have some social networking component, the importance of learning analytics and, and really having um, uh, new, because we can ask new questions now. And with the data, uh, we can connect who's talking to who, where they're talking, when they're talking. And I just think it's um, uh, a burgeoning field, and we need um, we need to make sure that we have the the, um, the analysts, the statisticians, the mathematicians, and we have enough of the learning people all in conversation to make sure that the questions we're asking and the measures that we're asking about this are are informing and informing informing each other. Great. So I want to pose one last question because we're near the end of this journey, um, but a number of people have asked about. Um, failure. Um, so we're interested in knowing about attempts at scaling that may not have been completely successful and lessons learned from that. So if you, any of you have any examples of attempts that didn't quite work out the way you expected them to, we would love to hear about those. Okay. <clears throat> I think one of the things that we learned recently was that our, our the interface in which you allow scaling to happen is very important. We were um, had been open to contributions from scholars for a while, but <coughs> we made our call an open one. And when we made an interface about the content that we were looking for, that was an open interface that was publicly available. <laughs> Um, and that everyone could see and um, correspond with us about. I think that that made a big difference. In other words, the way that we approach the public interface, the actual what, what it looked like and what people could do there, um, made a big difference. That makes sense. So, so you made reference. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you made yeah. reference to that before, but the. Uh, the ability to manage your audience once you begin to grow it and to have In a very transparent um, way. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go ahead. The ability to have a platform that can support that increased audience, I think, was something that you talked about earlier. The, the ability to scale up on the platform, but specifically now we're talking about a way that we've scaled up contribution. Ah, okay. um, and what we did was we just sort of openly posted on something called a Trello board. Um, what, what the contributions were that we were looking for, we organized them, and that's all open and publicly available. And something about the that interface of, of the open and public and the way that people could claim objects, other people could see who claimed objects, something about the openness and the transparency of that interface um, vastly increased um, the amount of contributions we're going to get. So I think it's not, it's not just a matter of being open to contributions, it's a, it's a matter of the actual interface in, in some ways can help or hinder that. Great. Anyone else care to comment? Okay. I, I, would, I would just add one last thing, which is that I think that the, thing, the area that I've seen failure is when people plan too large and, um, and seek to take on a project um, of a kind of of a kind of scale before things had been worked out at a rather smaller scale, and so going uh, just to seeking a very large grant to, to to build something from scratch rather than working in a kind of iterative way, and so I think just going back to that, that issue that we talked about earlier, which is let things grow on a, in a rather more organic way, paying attention to what you need to be a user. I think failure really comes when when you are ambitious from the outset. And, uh, and and you don't have, in a sense, that, that developed track record behind you. And I, I would say that, um, I'm, I mean, I think of, I believe in failure-driven learning. So I think with any of these initiatives, we're probably always failing to some level. And yeah. it's how do you understand and uh, recover um, and use it as a learning experience. 
as a data point to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I would say we we're, we have a lot of um, missteps, failures, but we don't we don't view them as lethal, and we try to you know learn from them. And 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 they're some of the most important data points you can have um, to help you figure out if you're if you're on track. If we were doing things and everything we did exceed, it's, then we shouldn't be funded for doing that work because it's not something that's necessarily new or pushing an envelope. Barbara, did you have a comment? Yes, I, I, I had um, I had kind of foreshadowed this earlier when I explained the importance of variation. Lots of times when we start small, we tend not to think about, well, what this might be like in another setting with a different population. Um, if we change the amount of time that we gave a particular program to work so that oftentimes people forget about making those kinds of assumptions early on so that would be one. The second thing would be not paying close enough attention to some of the um, things that are going on that might have interrupted or changed the nature of the intervention that we're looking at and then finally, um, it isn't so much the failure, but the unintended consequences of something that we're putting into place. Mm -hmm. So um, it very often turns out to be the case that you get something that happens that you weren't expecting to have happen happened. And then the one thing that you expected to have happen didn't quite happen the way that you expected it to. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the kinds of things that I, I think that if we pay a lot of attention to those things that we really have a much better chance at, um, at scaling something. And the failure part is certainly the case that when things fail, you really need to pay really close attention to why they fail very much the same way that we look at why they succeed. So the same kinds of principles that get, that you know guide us with failure also guide us with success. So Barbara, I think you've provided us with a pretty wonderful summary. The only other thing that I would add that I think I heard from all of you is that partnerships are important. University partnerships and having the research done can make a really big difference in terms of helping us to understand the viability of our work and being really clear about our goals and what we're attempting to achieve and what the models are that we're attempting to scale is also an important element in the work that we're attempting to do. So I thank all of you. I know there'll be another conversation after this one, a smaller conversation, but I think the audience learned a great deal from you and I know that everyone's being asked to scale up everything. And so um, this panel is an incredibly useful one at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.